Welcome back to Ask DRTK. And today we're going to take a look at an inexpensive mic booster from Clark Technic. It's the CT1. This might just be better than you think. Let's check it out. At around 30 US dollars, the Clark Technic CT1 mic booster is a very affordable offering for those needing a little extra gain to drive these hungry microphones like the SM7B. But for $30, can Clark Technic deliver? And so in this review, I'm going to unbox the CT1 mic booster. I'll briefly go through the specs, and then we'll listen to a dialogue comparison. I'll connect the SM7B directly up to the Focusrite Scarlett 8i6, and then I'll put the booster in line. I'll try and even out the gains as best as I can using the gain control on the 8i6, and we'll see just how much of a difference it makes. Then I'll go ahead and do a sine wave test. And so into Adobe Audition, I'm going to record a 20 to 20,000 hertz sine wave sweep both with and without the booster. And we'll take a look at the linear frequency response to see just in fact how much boost there is and if there's any coloration to the microphone using the booster. After that, we'll go ahead and test the uh, booster out with a couple of other preamps. We'll use the ART voice channel and the DBX286, and that'll give you my final thoughts. Okay, so the CT1 comes in some nice consumer packaging. Nothing really fancy, but it is well done here. We'll go ahead and slit that open. And uh, we'll see what we have. Box is fairly sturdy again, so it protects it. Yeah, some good uh, foam surrounding. See, we get some instructions in the top. Uh, we'll take a look at that. Uh, these instructions actually appear to have a couple of things. So interestingly, they show the booster use in line between mic cables. So uh, perhaps this isn't a plug into mic only. I see some technical specs as well here. I'll share those with you shortly. And we have the booster itself. This is a very heavy unit and appears to be actually quite well made. It's really solid, uh, but uh, we'll see how the audio performs. Uh, that, of course, is the big deal here. The CT1 booster from Clark Technic uses XLR connections, has an input impedance of 7 kilo ohms, and a maximum input level of minus 15 dBU. The output impedance is 2 kilo ohms with a max gain of plus 25 dB. Overall output max level is plus 10 dBU with a frequency response of 10 to 20,000 Hertz. The interesting thing here is the EIN is rated at around 120 dB between 22 and 22,000 Hertz. That's unweighted, so that is not weighted to the voice range. Rather, it is the overall response of the unit. The booster uses 48 volts of phantom power. And another interesting thing here is that it can be connected between two cables. So it doesn't have to go directly into the back of a microphone. You can go with a cable up to 30 feet, then the booster, and then a cable after that to your preamp. So that's a really good, uh, really good thing to think about. It's a fairly compact unit. I've given you the dimensions on the screen, but let's go ahead and check out the audio performance. And we'll start out by comparing my voice with and without the booster. So here we are on the Scarlett 8i6. I have the gain set at four o'clock with the SMB connected directly up to the interface. This is the level of the sound. I'm getting about minus 12 dB on the meters. So that's a pretty reasonable recording level. Certainly could drive the preamp a little bit further, but I like to say that sitting around minus 12 dB is about where I like to record. Certainly not uh, higher than that. I like to have some headroom if any post-processing is required. Now I'll go ahead and throw the mic booster on and uh, see just what kind of a difference it makes. And now I've added in the mic booster in line to the 8i6. I have it actually at the end of a 25 foot XLR cable from the SM7B and then a very short 18 inch patch cord into the 8i6. Of course, I've applied phantom power to activate the booster. I was able to turn the gain on the 8i6 down all the way to just a little under noon. So going from four o'clock down to noon, and I pretty much evened out the sound here. Again, we're sitting right at about that minus 12 dB on average. So significant difference. And now I'll go ahead and remove the booster and I'll apply 25 dB of gain in the plug-in chain. I don't expect to get the same quality of audio, but I'm interested to see if I'm in the neighborhood of 25 dB of gain from the mic booster. All right, and now I've removed the CT1 booster from the microphone cable. I've left the 8i6 set at just below noon, but I've added 25 dB of gain in my plug-in chain. And I can see from the level meter that I'm getting about the same amount of level. So again, this is not a scientific test, but just an overall impression of level while listening to my voice. Now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and actually run some tests with a tone generator, and we'll do very specific comparison across all frequency ranges to see how much boost we're getting from the mic, but also if there's any coloration to the audio that's happening. 
And these are the recordings that I did with and without the mic booster of a sine wave sweep from 20 to 20,000 hertz. You can see that there definitely is a variance. We're getting more boost from this, but let's take a closer look. You can see that I'm getting an average boost throughout most of the regular vocal range of actually about 15 dB. Now the rating of 25 dB is unweighted on this product. And so that means the entire range of its frequency response. And there may be some areas outside of the normal vocal range that give a larger boost, but in the usable vocal range, I'm gonna say I get more like about 15 dB out of this device. Not that that's a problem, it's just less than 25 if you're thinking you're gonna get an automatic 25 decibel boost of your vocals. Now that being said, when I did the test earlier and I used a 25 decibel boost in the plug-in chain after removing the uh, booster, it looked like I was getting about the same amount of gain. And in fact, the recording had a perceived similar loudness. So you can take that for what it is, but it's interesting to note that on a linear sign basis, the boost does appear to be less than the 25 dB that is in the specs. And while it appears I had about a 15 dB boost across the entire range of the sweep on average, really that test is more useful in terms of looking at the potential coloration. Are any areas of the frequency range a little bit higher or lower? And at first glance, it appears to me that there's a little bit of additional bass emphasis in the boost differential with this booster. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But now I'd like to go ahead and test three discrete frequencies, 400 hertz, one kilohertz, and eight kilohertz. And we'll do a direct comparison again with and without the booster. Gain settings will be the same on the Scarlett 8i6 for each test. We'll compare the amplitude and see uh, what we get. And looking at the gain of a 400 hertz test tone without the booster, it averaged in around minus 44 dB, whereas with the booster averaged in around minus 25 dB. So that's showing us about a 19 dB boost at 400 hertz. And again, that's averaged over the uh, period of the recording. And now we'll try 1000 hertz without the booster. Now we're looking at the comparison of one kilohertz and we can see that we've gone from minus 39 dB without the booster to minus 20 with the booster. So this frequency again shows a boost of 19 dB. And finally, we'll test 8,000 hertz without the booster. Now looking at the final comparison at eight kilohertz, we can see that without boost, we are getting an average signal of about negative 36 dB and with the boost, we're about minus 12 dB. So that's a 24 dB boost at eight kilohertz. And so this comparison with the three tones would seem to suggest that we actually get more boost in the higher range. Now that varies in contrast to what I observed with the sine wave test and where I really would have thought I'd be getting more low frequency emphasis but I will remind you that I am using the SM7B for this test. And the reason I chose this microphone instead of a, you know, a flat measurement microphone, which would be very difficult anyways, because most are condenser type, but assuming I get a very flat dynamic microphone with enough frequency response to measure accurately across 20 to 20 K, I would expect that I would see that. But this is interesting. I'm getting higher boost in the higher frequency range and considering that this type of booster is normally used with large dynamic microphones, the SM7B is a pretty good representation. Uh, I think it's interesting to show that maybe there's something going on behind the scenes here that we're trying to have a, a full sound, but also to uh, make up for some of the typically lower frequency uh, response or performance in the higher range on these type of microphones, again, that are targeted by this booster. It's just very interesting when you run the test back and forth. Ultimately, it comes down to the sound. I think uh, there's enough boost here to be used uh, for a lot of applications. 
Uh, so let's uh, let's move on with a few other tests. And now to give you an idea of how this booster performs with a couple of other preamps, I moved the SM7B over to the ART voice channel. Now I haven't added the booster to the signal chain and we have the gain set at three o'clock on the voice channel. And uh, this is a level you're getting. It's, uh, it's sitting again right in around that negative 12 dB for recording. And now I'll go ahead and add up the mic booster and see what that will do to the gain requirements on the preamp. And so now we have the signal going through the booster and I have a 25 foot XLR cable between the SM7B and the booster, followed by a 15 foot XLR cable between the booster and the ART voice channel. So a reasonable run of mic cable here. And as you can tell, I mean, I'm getting the signal. I've adjusted the level down to 10 o'clock on the ART based on it being at three o'clock before. So that's a significant reduction and gives me a lot of headroom to add extra into this mic if I need to with even greater cable runs. So uh, the booster is doing its job here. Let's go ahead and try it out with the DBX-286. And now you're listening to the SM7B on the DBX-286. I have a 25 foot cable connected to a 15 foot cable between the SM7B and the DBX. So I'm keeping that same cable run as I have with the booster installed. Right now I have the gain turned up very high on the DBX-286. It's basically a little bit past 430 to get this amount of level, which again is around that minus 12 on my recording uh, meters. So just to get an idea, this is the DBX-286 driving the SM7B. Now we'll go ahead and add up the booster and see what effect that gives us for headroom. And now I've added in the mic booster to the line to the DBX-286. Again, a 25 foot cable run between the SM7B and the booster followed by a 15 foot cable run to the DBX-286. And I'm getting about minus 12 on average on the levels. So again, getting a, a lot of signal here. I have the DBX-286 set just below noon on gain. So a lot of headroom left again on the preamp. So again, the booster is doing its job here. So now that I've run through a few tests using the Clark Technic mic booster, I'll give you a few of my thoughts. First of all, the spec for 25 dB a boost is unweighted. And so in this application where I'm using it for dialogue, that's a little bit misleading in terms of the amount of boost. It really in the dialogue range appears to be more like 15 dB. Not that that's a terrible thing, but it's just something to be aware of in terms of what to expect in actual signal gain. The other thing I'll note here, and you'll see it again looking at the comparison in the sine wave uh, analysis boosted and unboosted, is that these uh, boosters do add a little bit of coloration you can see that the amount of boost in the lower range is a little bit higher than it is in some of the upper ranges. So it actually ends up giving a little bit of a warmer tone to the overall sound. It's not really entirely unpleasing to my ear, but I did pick it up in listening back to the recordings and definitely it is visible on the graphs. Now, another thing I did was I actually tested two of these boosters. So I have uh, two of them that I used actually for sign comparisons. And I can tell you that there was essentially no difference between them. So the consistency of manufacture across these two samples is at least very good. And that's really an important thing if you're planning on using more than one of these, you know, if you have a few microphones that you want to test. The other thing I noticed again is that this booster is suitable for use connected either directly at the microphone or after a cable run. Now, again, they specify up to about 30 feet maximum before the booster. And certainly, I mean, the closer you have it to the mic, the better. You're going to be amplifying less cable noise, if any. Uh, but it is nice to have that flexibility where you can connect this either directly in at the microphone or along the cable run. The uh, ends on them are too thick to plug into an interface. They're not meant for that. It has to be cable to cable. But uh, beyond that, definitely very useful. So when asked whether I would recommend these boosters, I would have to say yes, in this price point, they definitely do perform. If we set aside trying to worry about whether or not we're achieving an actual specific amount of gain, just simply based on performance and usability, they worked very well. And you know, at a price point of around $30 at a time of recording, the build quality was very good. The consistency across the two samples was very good. And although there is some coloration of the tone, for me at least it was not unpleasant. And if you're interested in microphones, preamps, and other audio gear, Check out one of my reviews, like the one on screen. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.